On July 25th, an announcement shook the market. Evergrande Auto's subsidiaries, Evergrande New Energy Vehicle and Evergrande Smart Automotive, were filed for bankruptcy and reorganized by creditors in court. It signified the largest debt crisis in the history of China's new energy vehicle industry. Just 10 days later, Evergrande Group's parent company, Kailong Real Estate, also faced bankruptcy liquidation. This marked the collapse of this real estate empire and signals the accelerating burst of China's real estate bubble. In fact, Evergrande Group's debt problems have been long-standing. As early as 2021, Evergrande was already mired in debt. By the end of 2023, Evergrande Group had accumulated a debt of 2.4 trillion yuan, approximately $330 billion, which exceeded Greece's total GDP in 2023. In just the two years between 2021 and 2022, Evergrande lost over 800 billion yuan, equivalent to the annual GDP of Hainan province. A debt crisis of this magnitude is rare not only in China, but also globally. Among Evergrande Group's many businesses, Evergrande Auto was once considered the most valuable asset. It had advanced production facilities, semi-finished inventory, and ample raw materials, so it was expected to play a key role in repaying the group's debts. However, harsh reality shattered this illusion. Evergrande Auto itself was buried in debt, with total assets of only 35 billion yuan, while its total liabilities amounted to 73 billion yuan. Even if all of Evergrande Auto's assets were sold off, there would still be a funding gap of over 38 billion yuan. Of Evergrande Auto's 73 billion yuan debt, 27 billion of it has been secured with Evergrande Auto's assets as collateral. At first glance, it may seem reasonable to use Evergrande Auto's assets to repay these loans. However, a closer look reveals that 12.9 billion yuan of this debt actually belongs to Evergrande's founder and chairman, Hui Kanyan personally. Hui utilized a special arrangement where he acted as his own company's creditor. Through the company that controls Evergrande Auto, he issued 12.9 billion yuan in foreign debt, making himself an offshore creditor of Evergrande. As a result, during Evergrande Auto's bankruptcy liquidation, Hui Kaiyan, as a creditor, would be able to claim priority repayment of the debt, allowing this huge sum of money to be legally transferred overseas into his private pocket. With Hui playing the roles of owner, user, and creditor, the complex financial arrangement exposes many loopholes in China's financial regulatory system. Seeing Hui's actions, other creditors became increasingly uneasy. They worried that if Evergrande Auto prioritized repaying Hui's debt, it would not only allow him to legally transfer a massive amount of wealth to an offshore safe haven, but also make their own loans to Evergrande Auto unrecoverable as the company might no longer have sufficient assets to repay the other creditors. Moreover, the Hui family has a track record of preventing other creditors from getting compensation. In February, Hui Ka Yang's ex-wife, Ding Yu Mei, sued their youngest son, Xu He Teng, in Hong Kong, claiming that he failed to repay a debt of 1 billion Hong Kong dollars as stipulated in the loan agreement. This lawsuit led to the freezing of the money by the court, However, it is widely believed that this was done to prevent other creditors from accessing their family money. Having to deal with the various schemes of the Evergrande family, other creditors are feeling helpless. They fear that the tricks played in Hong Kong could happen again. As a result, these creditors decided to take a proactive approach by filing for debt restructuring. By involving external judicial authorities, they hope to reorganize the unfair debt repayment order pushing the Hui family from being a priority to the back of the line among creditors. The plight of Evergrande Auto stems from a deeper crisis of trust. Earlier this year, the market was abuzz with rumors that a potential investor was about to take over Evergrande Auto, rekindling hope among Evergrande shareholders and creditors. However, subsequent developments led many to suspect that this was merely a market manipulation. First, favorable news was released, driving up Evergrande Auto's stock price, then some institutions engage in large-scale short-selling at the peak, dumping Evergrande Auto's shares. Once the stock price plummeted to a low, they quietly repurchased the shares at bargain prices. Although there is no concrete evidence to prove that China Evergrande itself was behind these moves, one thing is clear. Short-selling institutions must first borrow Evergrande Auto shares from other shareholders to carry out short-selling. As the largest shareholder of Evergrande Auto, it is highly likely that Evergrande Group 
itself participated and profiteered from this process. These signs have severely shaken the confidence of Evergrande Auto's shareholders and creditors. This kind of stock price manipulation is not uncommon in the Chinese stock market, often mockingly referred to as the cutting of leagues, a term describing retail investors getting exploited by more powerful players. However, when such behavior involves a giant like Evergrande, its negative impact cannot be underestimated. Watching their interests repeatedly harm, the patience of the creditors is wearing thin, so they decided to preemptively initiate legal proceedings. They also aim to pressure the government to recognize the seriousness of the Evergrande issue and take decisive measures to address it. The Chinese government faces a dilemma. If it chooses to bail out Evergrande, it may temporarily stabilize the situation, but it is also a moral hazard, encouraging other companies to emulate Evergrande's risky behavior, leading to even greater systemic risks. On the other hand, if it allows Evergrande to fend for itself, it could trigger a chain reaction in the financial system, potentially threatening social stability. Faced with this challenge, the authorities seem to prefer that the fallout from Evergrande's crisis be released slowly, minimizing the impact on the economy and society. However, with Evergrande Auto having accumulated losses of up to 90 billion yuan over the past three years, even the authorities may find it difficult to squeeze more money out of Hui to fill the financial gap. If the authorities cannot offer Hui benefits like a reduced prison sentence, he might choose to fully detonate this bomb, letting the situation spiral out of control. If Evergrande ultimately heads towards bankruptcy and restructuring, the consequences could be disastrous. Asset values may plummet, judicial proceedings could drag on indefinitely, creditors may be unable to recover their funds for a long time, and China's banking system and the upstream and downstream industries connected to Evergrande would be affected. The entire real estate and automotive industries could also suffer heavily. In this storm, not only will Evergrande itself struggle to survive, but the Chinese economy will also pay a heavy price. As expected by the market, just a week later, on August 5th, Evergrande Group's parent company, Kailong Real Estate, was also filed for bankruptcy liquidation by creditors. As the holding platform of the Evergrande empire, Kailong Real Estate holds 60.3% of Evergrande Real Estate Group's shares and fully owns Evergrande Group, underscoring its critical role. The bankruptcy liquidation application for Kailong Real Estate signifies that this once powerful real estate company has entered the final stage of its collapse. Currently, both China's real estate industry and the electric vehicle market are facing unprecedented challenges and risks. According to 2023 financial data, the debt-to-asset ratio of Li Auto was 57.8%, and Xpeng Motors was 56.8%, both of which are relatively low. Although Xiaomi Group has not separately disclosed specific financial data for its electric vehicle division, the overall debt-to-asset ratio of the group is 49.3%, also within a healthy range. In contrast, NIO's debt-to-asset ratio is close to 75%, indicating a relatively higher financial risk. Generally, a debt-to-asset ratio between 40% and 60% is considered relatively healthy. When this ratio exceeds 70%, it crosses the warning line, and the financial risk becomes significant. Among the electric vehicle manufacturers, NIO's financial situation is the most precarious, with a debt-to-asset ratio nearing 75%, far above the industry average. As a dominant player in China's electric vehicle market, BYD has also engaged in heavy borrowing to rapidly expand its market share and production capacity. Data shows that by the end of 2023, BYD's debt-to-asset ratio had reached 78%, signaling dangerous levels of over-leveraging. The booming sales of EVs have largely been driven by government subsidies and support policies. However, the market space expanded by these subsidies inevitably has its limits. As this limit approaches and support policies begin to gradually phase out, the entire EV industry will inevitably face a downturn. Among the various subsidies, the most direct and substantial measure from the Chinese government is the consumer car purchase subsidy. Take for example BYD's flagship model, Tong. Under the current policy, consumers who purchase a Tong can receive a central government subsidy of approximately 30,000 yuan, and local governments match this subsidy one-to-one. -one. Providing an additional this means 30, the total yuan. subsidy per vehicle reaches as much as 60,000 yuan. 
More importantly, this subsidy is applied for by the dealer on behalf of the consumer at the time of purchase and is directly deducted from the car's price. Based on the BYD Tong's list price of 279,800 yuan, after deducting the 60,000 yuan subsidy, the actual price paid by the consumer drops to 219,800 yuan, amounting to a substantial 21% discount. In addition to direct cash subsidies, the exemption of sales tax on electric vehicles also provides significant savings for consumers. According to current policy, new energy vehicles purchased between January 1, 2024 and December 31, 2025 are fully exempt from sales tax, saving consumers up to 30,000 yuan per vehicle. For new energy vehicles purchased between January 1, 2026 and December 31, 2027, the tax is halved, with a maximum tax saving of 15,000 yuan per vehicle. Taking the flagship version of BYD Tong as an example, the sales tax exemption alone allows consumers to save nearly 20,000 yuan. Beyond consumer subsidies, the Chinese government also supports the EV industry by providing financial backing for R&D, fostering innovation within the sector. According to a report released by the U.S. Center for Strategic and International Studies, in the first half of this year, the Chinese government has invested heavily in the EV industry. Since 2009, the government has provided direct funding with cumulative investments reaching as much as $231 billion. The scale of these subsidies has increased year by year, which correlates with the continuous expansion of EV production capacity in recent years. The Chinese government also introduced favorable loan policies, such as low down payments and low interest rates for EV consumers, and has provided preferential credit for automakers to expand their production capacity. Compared to direct subsidies, these credit support have had an even more significant impact on boosting production capacity. It can be said that the robust development of China's EV industry has been achieved under the central government's protection. As various support policies are gradually phased out, the EV industry inevitably faces a series of severe challenges, such as intensified competition and overcapacity. During this process, the cost control of different automakers will be a key factor. Data from 2023 shows that BYD and Li Auto both have gross margins exceeding 20%, putting them at the forefront of the industry in terms of cost management. Following closely is Tesla China with a gross margin of around 18%. In contrast, NIO and Xpeng have gross margins of only 9.5% and 1.5% respectively. When considering net profit margins, Xpeng was already in the red in 2023, making it a likely candidate for elimination in the industry's shakeout. In addition to domestic market challenges, Chinese EV companies face significant hurdles in exporting their products. Major economies like the US and the EU have imposed tariffs on Chinese EV exports, with the EU's tariffs taking effect on July 5th. The real impact of these tariffs on the Chinese EV industry will become apparent within a quarter. If the government's investment in the EV industry cannot create a positive ripple effect across other industries, it will essentially be burning money. Compared to the fluctuations in the EV industry, the tremors in the real estate market are even more intense. As a leader in China's real estate, the complete collapse of Evergrande Group signals the accelerated burst of the real estate bubble. Meanwhile, another real estate giant, Country Garden, has also experienced a sharp decline in performance. Data shows that Country Garden's sales in July plummeted by 72% year-on-year, with sales volume dropping by 76%. Currently, Country Garden's stock remains suspended, and if this situation continues for 18 months, the company will face mandatory delisting. Authoritative institutions and investment banks have expressed deep concern about the outlook for China's real estate market. In its latest report, Nomura Securities warned that the Chinese real estate crisis has not yet bottomed out, and in addition to the significant decline in sales, new adversities are further suppressing housing demand. Statistics from the China Index Academy show that in July, the sales of the top 100 real estate companies fell by 36% month-on-month, and the cumulative year-on-year decline from January to July reached 40%.
At the same time, the number of large-scale real estate companies continues to decrease, with four fewer companies in the trillion yuan category and 34 fewer in the 100 billion yuan category. Given such a grim situation, Nomura Securities recommends that the authorities adopt more aggressive stimulus policies, but also acknowledges that this will be a challenging process. What's even more striking is the International Monetary Fund has openly called on the Chinese government to assist home buyers who have purchased unfinished properties. The IMS suggested that for real estate projects that have entered bankruptcy proceedings and lack commercial sustainability, the government could consider using central fiscal resources to ensure that the projects are completed and delivered, or to provide corresponding compensation to the home buyers. For projects that are commercially sustainable but face financial issues, the government could offer risk-sharing capital or guarantees to ease their financial pressures. According to IMF estimates, this market rescue plan could cost approximately 1 trillion US dollars over four years, equivalent to 5.5% of China's GDP. However, in response to the IMF suggestion, Chinese officials gave a clear refusal, citing that it is inappropriate for the central government to directly provide fiscal support to avoid creating an expectation of government bailouts, which could lead to a moral hazard. This incident highlights a critical issue. When local government or urban investment company debts default, they often receive what is known as a government bailout, and in some cases, they resolve to criminalize the debt, where authorities may arrest creditors on random charges like provoking trouble to pressure them into reducing or waiving the debt. However, when the rights of a large number of home buyers are at stake, the government refuses to intervene, citing moral hazard as a reason. This contrast in policy and public opinion reflects various flaws in the current Chinese economic system. The IMF report also indirectly confirms that the severity of the Chinese real estate crisis may exceed most people's expectations. The estimated $1 trillion in the report is also 1.7 times the size of China's central fiscal deficit in 2023, which is around $600 billion U.S. dollars. Amid the challenges faced by key industries like electric vehicles and real estate, the Chinese economy is grappling with even more severe issues. In particular, the government's handling of corporate debt defaults and the protection of personal property rights, including its balance between procedural and substantive justice, as well as the consistency and fairness of its actions, require close scrutiny.